I just wanted to um, mention a little bit about the project. I know that we've had um, a lot of questions about it. Um, what I would like you to do is, if you have some ideas, um, can you let me, can you go through them with me and then we can make sure that you're on the right track? Um, and I can run them by Jose as well. Um, and you can do that by email. I can stay behind after class today. Um, so uh, contact me and we can go through the ideas for the project together. Um, Jose is on flying on his way to Cambodia right now. Um, and um, he prepared a little video. People of George Washington, how are you? Well, um, I've been very busy, very much like you. I wish I show up in one or two more classes, but I've been kind of all around the world. Uh, and I'm very happy about it because I've been learning so many more things precisely about making next year's class even better. So I mean, wow, the best trip was to Haiti with President Clinton, where kind of we visit different farms where the Clinton Global Initiative and other partners, they've been doing amazing things, uh, bringing farming forward uh, into the economy of um, Haiti. So uh, that was an amazing trip and I hope one-on-one -on -one to share with you photos and all the amazing things I've learned. I'm on my way right now, one hour away from going to Cambodia, where I'm going to a conference about clean cook stoves. You already listened to me talking about the clean cook stoves, but this is going to be like the conference of conference. And uh, I need to be there because I am the ambassador for the United Nations on clean cook stoves. But the good thing is that I'm very happy we are doing this class in this moment, because if you take a look, the last three, four, five, six months, everything seems to go around food issues. New York is trying to ban uh, sugary drinks or is trying to ban big sugary drinks like Cokes and other drinks. And everyone has something to say. Some people think this is the right thing to fight obesity. Other people think that this is dumb, that this is not the way to fight anything. Wow, food again at the heart of controversy. And we need to come up with the best solution. Um, what other things are happening? Horse meat seems now everywhere in Europe. No one knew that when you had a big burger, you were having horse meat. Listen, horse meat is delicious. I've eaten horse meat since I was very little. The issue here is that people don't know what they are eating. And almost brings me back to Mr. Sinclair when he brought the jungle at the beginning of the 20th century where somehow I feel like a century later we are almost in the same place. Well, my friends, food issues are at the heart of everything we are. When we think about hunger and obesity, in this case hunger, we think about Haiti, we think about South America, we think about Africa. I'm inviting you to download on Apple or to go to the movie theater and to see the great documentary of my friend um, Laurie Silverbush, uh, married to Tom Colicchio, one of the great chefs in America, and they've done this amazing documentary, A Place at the Table, where brings the issue of hunger right here in America. If you have time, I would love for you to go to see this amazing documentary, because I, I believe your perspective about food uh, is going to change day and night. So anyway, uh, already too much uh, talk. Now I have the honor to introduce you to a very good friend, a person that I admire, a person that many years ago I went to a book signing and I was very scared. He barely looked at me in the eyes. I tried to shake his hand. He's a very serious guy. He doesn't go shaking hands to everybody. Well, I'm very happy that many, many, many years later, uh, I'm honored to call him friend. His name is uh, Dr. Kimball. Christopher Kimball, without a doubt, is one of the most notorious um, people in the food field of ours. Is nothing about food that he doesn't know. 
and I'm not gonna lie to you, some of the best recipes I use in my home, they come, they come from him. They come from his amazing magazine, uh, Cooks Illustrated, where uh, 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 every time, every recipe, it's created and recreated and tested under a new lens, giving people recipes that not, not only work perfect, but where people are empowered with knowledge. Everybody is gonna know why the chicken is dry or why the chicken should be moist. Uh, everybody is gonna know how to grill uh, a, a pork chop perfectly. Everybody is gonna learn how to make the Spanish soup gazpacho perfect. So if you talk about somebody that is bringing knowledge, that's him. But more important, he's also a scholar on, on history, especially history of American cooking. He's an expert on the Victorian cooking that happened around uh, Massachusetts. And I was honored to film, uh, to be part of a show with him about Fanny Farmer, uh, the amazing woman, the amazing Bostonian uh, who single-handed was very, very influential in moving uh, cooking forward at the beginning of the century. And it cuts off abruptly there. Um, <coughs> what? Um, another half hour. Probably. <laughs> yes. <coughs> the camera just died. Um, uh, he didn't get to mention that um, uh, Chris Kimball is also the author of the Cook's Bible, the Yellow Farmhouse Cookbook, Dear Charlie, the Dessert Bible, and Fanny's Last Supper. I know quite a few of you read um, at least a couple of chapters from that book, and it's a very ambitious project that you took on there, and love to hear more about it. Sounds amazing. Recreating a 12-course um, Victorian meal, um, and um, also on America's Test Kitchen, um, which is in its 13th season. Um, so that's fabulous. I know you're in for a treat. Um, he was very entertaining in the green room, so I'm delighted to hear about the history of food in how many minutes? Well, I can't tell those jokes here somewhere. Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <coughs> so history of food in 90 minutes is going to be 65 minutes now. Um, so let's get started. I love everyone talks about local food as if it was something new. Because obviously, for thousands of years, all the food was, in fact, local. So uh, we're just going back to where we were 10,000 years ago. With one exception, which is there are certain things which did travel well, like spices. So in the Ottoman Empire, for example, they built a cuisine on almost 90 different spices and herbs, whereas in Northern Europe, they built a cuisine on 14. And the reason was the Ottoman Empire was on the trade routes, and so Although all the fresh ingredients were local, the way they crafted a cuisine had a lot to do with travel and this trade routes. And so other things did travel well, eventually. Uh, ginger came from preserved from China. Obviously, spices came from the east. Um, fortified wines, that's why port was invented, of course, because if you put a red wine on a ship for three, three months and jostled it and made it hot and cold, it was turned sour on you. And so they fortified it with more alcohol so it would keep. So it was a combination of local and also from all over the world. We'll get into Boston in a few minutes, but by the 1880s in Boston, uh, there was a large store there called S.S. Pierce that had over 4,000 items for sale. It was the original, you know, Dean and DeLuca. And you could get mushrooms from outside Paris. You could get things from Russia. You could get things from Italy. So the world was a very large place starting in the late 1800s. Um, everything started with fire. Um, if you think about it, uh, most countries had the 80-20 rule, which was the protein was about 20% of your diet at top, and the rest of it was starch, uh, it might have been rice, it might have been potatoes, cassava, whatever, it might have been legume, some fresh vegetables. But in England, it was flipped around. And the reason was the climate was perfectly suited for grazing. There were a lot of wood for fires, and so they spit-roasted uh, meat. And Actually, spit roasting is, is rather different. Um, B. Wilson talks about this in her book, Consider the Fork. The meat wasn't actually roasted over the fire, it was roasted near fire. Uh, and they invented all sorts of interesting ways of keeping the spits going. Originally, you had to stand and turn the spit for hours and hours. As a matter of fact, young boys were used in the large medieval uh, fireplaces to do that. Then they bred specific dogs called turnspits, 
They were dogs with very short legs, and they were, they were hung on a wall, and you know, they just ran around all day like hamsters, and they would turn it. And then finally, which seems totally incredible, I don't believe a word of it, but I looked it up, and it's true. And the other thing they invented finally was the clock jack, and so they would have, like a grandfather clock, they'd have a series of weights, which over a very long period of time would turn the meat, and the little bell would go off when you're done. So that's how it got started. All that was moved inside into the fireplace. You can see here, um, Yorkshire pudding, for example, was invented this way. The fat would drip down into a, a pan, which caught it underneath. And you'd take a batter, uh, Yorkshire pudding, and throw it into the hot grease. And you'd bake up uh, some bread, which was the first course. <clears throat> this is in my town in Vermont. We still do this. It's called the ox roast. Uh, it's not actually an ox. It's the slowest moving heifer uh, in town. And uh, we, about a week before, we get the heifer and then age the meat a little bit. And then we have uh, a very similar method, which is we start the night before. Uh, a lot of beer is consumed. A fire is built over 12 hours. At about 6 in the morning, uh, we have this contraption, which was built by a guy who died many years ago. But it was all homemade. Uh, we use sheep wire fencing and mattress springs. And we take two hindquarters, you know, the steamship rounds, the upper thigh, and, uh, and cook it all day. And about 6 o'clock, we have uh, a large party. One year, I was put in charge of determining when the roasts were done. And I thought medium rare was good. You know, Vermonters, nobody ate any of it because it was pink. So Vermonters, I learned, liked their meat well done. So I was fired after that. Um, cookbooks, uh, this is the first one, uh, Amelia Simmons in the 1790s, American Cookery. Hence, James Beard's book in 1972 called American Cookery. Uh, this was the first one. When you start looking back at old American cookbooks, you discover that they stole recipes like crazy. The same recipe shows up over 100 years, from 1800 to 1900. You see the same recipe with a few minor changes, sometimes no changes whatsoever. So there wasn't a lot of originality going on in cookbooks early on. The Kentucky Housewife, uh, they had all these uh, books based upon different areas of the country. Again, you could look at recipes from Kentucky Housewife and then see them show up in Fanny Farmer or Mrs. Lincoln's cookbook almost unchanged later on. Um, then the Boston Cooking School cookbook. Um, the original book was, nine, was 1883, Mrs. Lincoln. She ran the Boston Cooking School. It was a nonprofit. It was supposed to help out the poor. Uh, a lot of uh, people were getting uh, bad nutrition because they were drinking a lot and not cooking properly. So it started out as a public service. And, uh, in fact, what Fanny did uh, was, in 1896, she really took Mrs. Lincoln's cookbook, and she did adapt it, and she did revise it, and it was a better book. But most of the stuff really started with Mrs. Lincoln. And, and, and Fanny was smart enough to copyright the book in her own name, not in the name of the school. So then she went on to fame and fortune. But all of this was really based on a cookbook that was published in 1883. Oh, and by the way, this thing she's often referred to as the, you know, the mother of level measurements. You've probably heard that before. That was complete nonsense. In fact, uh, there was a lot of ways of measuring at the time which were perfectly fine. It's true that Fanny did actually talk about level measurements, but it really, really didn't mean that much. So we went from the fire outside to the fireplace, and then we went to stoves. There's a guy called Rumford, uh, invented the first stove in the 1840s. Um, and this completely changed cooking. You know, the first thing that changed cooking was thousands of years before that was the clay cooking pot. And before that, uh, you had a problem because a lot of foods couldn't be eaten because they were undigestible, like legumes. They had to be cooked. A lot of meat was too tough. And so scientists went back and looked. And it turns out that there weren't a lot of old people with bad teeth. Because once you, your teeth started falling out or you had bad teeth, you died because you had to chew. If you couldn't chew, you were dead. <clears throat> so once they invented the ceramic cooking pot, uh, the brass pot, the metal pot started about 3,000 BC. Cast iron was about 500 BC. Once that happened, if you look at the skeletal remains, you can find people with bad teeth who actually lived to be 70 years old because the food was soft, it was digestible, you didn't have to have really good teeth. In fact, today, as you know, we have an overbite. Well, it turns out that before the invention of the cooking vessel, our teeth did not have an overbite. That is, the top and the bottom were perfectly meshed, which was designed for tearing into tough food. It's much more efficient. Once the food became soft and cooked, the overbite appeared, which means that now we had a very different kind of diet. So uh, all of a sudden, roasting, 
uh, was being done now in ovens. And it turns out that we don't really roast our meat or we bake our meat. And a roasting really means over fire or near a fire. So everything came into the oven. Um, these are gem pans. Um, a lot of baking in those days was done, these kinds of pans. We use them for the Finney Farmer dinner, which I'll get into in a few minutes. Um, and, and so desserts, for example, were baked individual cakes. They, they didn't tend to bake big cakes. So things were done in individual portions. And the stoves um, you know, put that on the, on the back burner. And I'll show you the stove I actually had installed in my house for this. The back burner was the lowest. There were two burners in the back that is rounds of cast iron. Those were the lowest heat. And there were four in the front. Two on the sides were medium, and the two in the middle were the hottest right over the wood source. So putting something in the back burner meant nice and slow. So a lot of things came out of this. The water bath, the bamboo, came out of the cast iron stove. Why is that? Well, if you wanted to put something on the stove and keep it at a, at a 212 degrees, put in water, because water's not going to get ho hotter than 212 degrees. And the, the original bain-maries were long sort of oval pots, pans, and you put smaller pots in them to keep sauces warm, for example. Um, the gas stove, actually an early model of the gas stove uh, was invented in the 1840s. It didn't come into use towards, until the end of the 19th century. The problem with gas stoves is there wasn't any gas. You know, that was a real problem. In Boston in the 1880s and 90s, they started installing the gas lines. At first, they were very expensive. By 1900, the price of gas had come way down. So the early 20th century, you start seeing the use of gas stoves. Everyone thought that if you used a gas stove, you were going to poison yourself, because in the oven, they were concerned with that. So the gas companies and the gas stove companies started advertising. And one of the things that came out of this was a cold oven cakes, like a cold oven pound cake. And they sold the gas stoves by saying, you can start your, your cake or whatever in a cold stove, then turn it on. It'll save money. You don't have to use up all that much fuel. Very similar point as today. Um, this is the kitchen that was at the Chicago Exposition of 1898. This was all the tools they had. About 1880, the American manufacturers got into the game. Before that, you had a very simple uh, battery to cuisine, something probably more like this. You'd have a few pots and pans. Um, the, those egg beaters uh, were invented in the 1880s, late 1880s, were very popular, although incredibly inefficient. Actually, I grew up with one of those, oddly enough. Um, so you didn't have a lot of things. Um, this might have been you know, a, few, a few spoons. Before 1890, there were not standardized measurements. You didn't have standardized tablespoons and teaspoons. So when Fannie Farmer did her book in 1896, she was able to take advantage of the fact that um, American manufacturers had standardized measuring cups. Um, but by 1900, you were starting to get a lot of inventions. And all of a sudden, you know, the world of the kitchen really opened up. The other thing that happened was um, the kitchen was a dump. I mean, before 1850 or 60, because the only people who in the kitchen were the servants, if you had some money and you had servants. So in Boston, in a wealthy household, if you went down to the kitchen, the kitchen was in the basement. It was in the back. Uh, it was whitewashed or limed walls. Uh, they were concerned with cleanliness. It was probably dark. It was hot. There was a lot of coal dust. That huge cast iron monster that's six feet wide is very hot all day, start at 5.30 in the morning. And it was, it was a nasty place to be. By the 1880s, 1890s, uh, help was harder to get. Uh, women now had other opportunities, not exciting ones, but you could get out of domestic work and go do other things, work in a factory, for example. You could start your own business uh, talking to the dead. That was a very big uh, business in Boston in the 1880s and 90s. Everyone wanted to talk to their, to their, their, their kids if they died in childbirth or to their parents. Um, they could be nurses. They could do lots of other things. So all of a sudden, it was hard to attract people to work in the house. And so the quote unquote lady of the house actually had to now spend time in the kitchen. By 1900, you know, the, the, usually the, the woman of the house actually had to cook. So all of a sudden, interior designers came into play. And by the 1880s and 90s, kitchens started to have wallpaper. They started to have nicer windows. They started to have furniture. So instead of being this very functional room that had one table in the middle, a coal stove, a few cupboards, a larder, a scullery, now you had a room where someone would actually want to spend some time in, and that was the beginning of the modern kitchen. Um, let's talk about food for a second. Uh, this is Quincy Market uh, in 1880. <clears throat> Around 1880, most food, as I said, was local. 
Uh, you might get turkeys from Vermont. Uh, you'd obviously have fish if you were in Boston. Um, but everything basically came from New England. Um, that started to change in the 1890s, 1880s, when all of a sudden the Midwest opened up. And all of a sudden, you had larger farms. You had better soil. New England has terrible soil. So you could get your turkeys now for a much lower price, but they were shipped in. They built the railroads out in the 1870s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. You could get things coming in from other parts of the country. And by 1890, you were actually getting some produce all the way from California. So you all of a sudden, in the last quarter of the 19th century, the, the number of things you could get had, had gone way, way up. And it wasn't just all local ingredients. <clears throat> And as I said, in Boston, S.S. Pierce, which was started, I think, in the 1860s or 70s, that was the first major food store in, in, in New England. They had over 4,000 items. And as I said, you get mushrooms from outside of Paris. Uh, you could get isinglass, which was a thickener, like gelatin from Russia. You could get pasta. You could get cheese from Italy. Parmesan came from Italy. So all of a sudden, with the invention of the steamship, which meant, of course, cross Atlantic travel was a few days, not a few weeks, you could all of a sudden stock your larder with things from really all over Europe. Um, as I said, England ate a lot of beef. That's why they were called beef eaters, because they were paid in part in beef. Uh, and that's one reason why our own cuisine in America at least started out very heavy on meat, because that was the tradition from England. Um, in fact, the, the roast beef of England was uh, painted by famous painters. There's lots of songs, one of which I sang on one of our shows once, which I can't remember. <laughs> But it was a very unusual diet because most of the world was using very little protein. Um, in America, once the railroads were built out, then railheads uh, west were established. And don't forget, it wasn't that long ago where beef in Boston, for example, they walked the beef into town. You know, Washington Street, I used to live off Washington Street, uh, was the main thoroughfare in a town. That's where Paul Revere rode out. <clears throat> and you go through the neck. And they, in, the, in the morning, the cattle would be walked in and butchered in town. With the advent of the railroads and the beef coming to Chicago and then refrigerated rail cars, which started occurring in the 1880s, all of a sudden, all the beef was processed, not in the local towns, but most of it was being processed in Chicago, put in a refrigerator car, and then shipped out to Boston. And that changed everything. That's all of a sudden you get the industry of beef. In fact, Henry Ford, uh, took his model of the factory from one of the large uh, meat factories, where the cattle walked in live at the top floor. And by the time you got to the basement, they were making hot dogs and everything else in between. So that notion of, of really taking something whole and, and breaking it down to its parts, Henry Ford did the opposite. He took the parts and put it into something in the whole. But that whole idea of the American car industry came from the American meat factory. Um, and then the other thing that is interesting about history about food is that uh, it's really the history of the rich. You know, if you think about it, <clears throat> we think about how the rich ate because most people writing about their culture, uh, the poor weren't going to pay them to write about themselves, so they were writing about rich people. So when you think about how we ate about in the Victorian times, you're not talking about the average day laborer. You're talking about how the wealthy citizens of Boston, New York, or London ate. You know, uh, Downton Abbey, that's Edwardian, late Victorian. You know, there were only 20,000 people in all of England who lived that life, a tiny percentage of the population. So when you think about that time, that's usually what's presented. That's not how most people actually ate. So when you went to a meat market, if you were wealthy, you get the prime cuts. You get the chops, you get the tenderloin, et cetera. If you were middle class, you might get some of the chuck or whatever. If you were poor, you got the worst cuts. So the poor were eating the stuff that the rich didn't want to eat. The expression, uh, scraping the bottom of the barrel, refers to a pork barrel. Because uh, when a pig was slaughtered, the bad cuts, the worst cuts, were salted down and put into a barrel in the basement over the winter, hopefully in a cold basement. And so by March, you scrape the bottom of the barrel. And that's what the poor ate, was the worst cuts salted, heavily preserved, and you cook them with other things. So when you look at the history of food, you have to be very suspicious about who was doing the eating and the buying of the food, because usually it wasn't the average Joe. Um, yeah, we had a lot of beef. Everybody had pigs in the south and the north. Uh, they were small. They were easy to raise anywhere. Um, that's where pork came into our diet. Um, the, 
the 19th century is fascinating because this is the beginning of the commercial food movement. Um, leaveners. Uh, early on, all the leaveners were yeast. Matter of fact, there's a whole tradition of English cakes, which are yeasty cakes. So if you wanted to bake something that rose that was not bread, it was a dessert, for example, you use yeast. The next thing they use are egg whites. And uh, so, for example, Boston cream pie uh, are essentially egg white risen cakes and filled uh, with, a, with a custard and then poured chocolate poured over the top, which at that time in the 1880s was very expensive. But that was the kind of cake that we, you, you would use if you wanted to use egg whites. Eventually, they got on to something called saleratus from sal, which is sale, which is from the Latin, which means salt. This was made actually from trees, <coughs> from the ashes. And uh, it's, it's today's baking soda. It was very strong. Uh, it was inconsistent. You see a lot of recipes today that call for putting baking soda in warm water to start. And that one reason was to sort of reduce its effectiveness because it was so strong. Uh, by the 1850s, a guy called Twight, Dwight figured out how to make baking soda in a factory. And by 1890s, he and a guy called Church came up with a Church and Dwight baking soda, which is still a company around in New Jersey today. So that was baking soda was the first standardized commercial leavener uh, in history. A little later, uh, they got onto baking powder. Baking powder is just baking soda with two different kinds of acids usually. That's called double acting, one of which works at, in the presence of liquid and one of which works at temperatures, oven temperatures over 120 degrees. Um, so all the leavening power doesn't disappear once you create the batter. Some of it still sits around until you heat it up. And so baking powder was better than baking soda because it was all together in one place. You didn't have to add acid to it. Um, local dairy production, uh, when I was a kid, we still got milk this way, which shows you how old I am. Uh, but the, there was a real problem with milk, which was a lot of kids died from it. And the problem was, especially in the South, uh, when it was hot, uh, it was hard to preserve milk. Uh, it went bad. Uh, there was no standardization of farms. Um, since two things come out of the back end of a cow, one of which is milk, you have a lot of contamination problems. And actually, this uh, happened in 1852. A guy called Gail Borden was on a ship from London to, or England to uh, New York, and a number of kids died on board because of the milk was bad, it was contaminated. So he decided to figure out a way to evaporate milk and can it so it was safe. And he used a method uh, the shakers used, actually, for reducing down uh, liquids. And he, decided, he figured out how to do evaporated milk. So evaporated milk, that's why the advertisement has kids, has babies, it was safe. And it was a way also to keep milk for a long time in very hot weather. Um, so evaporated milk became part of the lexicon. Um, I mentioned this briefly. Thickeners, uh, they didn't have gelatin. Uh, for the Fanny Farmer dinner, which I'll show you, we actually boiled calf's feet to make our own gelatin, which is better. It doesn't smell like meat. It doesn't smell like calf's feet. It actually uh, is a nice thick liquid. You add a little sugar and lemon juice and water to it as a base. Uh, but originally, uh, the thickener that was used was isinglass. Anybody know what that is? It's made from the, uh, the swim bladders of fish. And it looks like uh, Chinese uh, cellophane noodles. And you soak it in water, and it worked as a thickener. And they got it mostly out of Russia. Uh, and that was used for quite a while. Then they made it from calves' feet. They boiled calves' feet like I did, and I'll show you that in a minute. Um, and that was used as, as gelatin, as Knox gelatin. The thing that was also used, you often see Irish moss. That's something referred to in 19th century books. That's actually seaweed. It was gathered off the west coast of Ireland. It was also gathered off the coast of New England. It's a special kind of seaweed. It was dried in the sun. It was rinsed in water to get the salt off. Uh, and that was similar to isinglass. <coughs> um, the beehive was uniquely unsuited to commercial production because to get the honey out, you had to destroy a lot of the hive. And so finally, someone figured out, and I raised bees myself, uh, wooden boxes uh, called supers. And then you have these trays, these wooden trays, where the bees will build out uh, with wax uh, what they need to to fill them with honey. You can take them out, decap them, that is remove the outer layer, get the honey out, usually by spinning them, and then putting them back into the box, leaving enough honey for the bees for the winter. Uh, 
And so all of a sudden, honey was commercialized. You could produce a lot of it. And they started especially doing this in California next to, next to large crops. Um, this guy wasn't a lot of fun. Um, he was the first health food nut in the country, Sylvester Graham. Uh, Graham flour is something you'll see in a lot of old cookbooks. It's a, it's a whole wheat flour. Um, he invented the first health food store. There were health food stores in this country over, well over 100 years ago. Uh, and uh, he was a, uh, solicited the notion of good health. The whole idea of health and food uh, was very strong in the 1880s and 90s. And, and in fact, Fannie Farmer wrote a book specifically about this. And she lectured at Harvard on the subject. Her main interest actually was health, uh, less so fun recipes. And it, people were very concerned about health. And a lot of the cookbooks actually were geared towards people who were sick. And she had whole chapters in her original book about cooking for people who were ill, because people got ill a lot at the time. And so Sylvester Graham was the best known person sort of uh, head of the health food movement in this country. And Graham flour still exists today as a result of Sylvester Graham. Uh, he, he would not have been a lot of fun at dinner party, uh, but he was a man of few words, but he was the first guy. Uh, here's someone who would have been fun at a, at a dinner party. She was an actress from vaudeville uh, days, and uh, early vaudeville, I guess. And uh, in the 1890s, uh, someone had decided uh, to buy a company that made a pancake mix, uh, because by the 1890s, cereals were getting started, Kellogg, Post, et cetera. I'll talk about that in a minute. And so they hired her at the Chicago World's Fair in 1898 to go out and hawk these pancakes. Well, she sold thousands of pancakes. It was a huge success. She was an instant uh, you know, household name. And she lived until 1923. She died in an automobile accident in Chicago. Uh, but she was extraordinarily successful. Uh, and it was really one of the first examples. It was sort of the first Martha Stewart, you know, putting a face on a product. Aunt Jemima was really the first person who did that enormously successfully. Uh, and that's how the brand went from nothing to being uh, just a huge powerhouse. Um, restaurants at the time, there was a lot of French influence, uh, of course. Uh, Delmonico's, the Flatiron Building in New York, uh, they had a number of locations over the years, was probably the preeminent restaurant of its time. Um, and Fanny used to say she'd go down there for dinner, and she would take a dab of sauce in her handkerchief and bring it back to analyze it, which sounds like complete nonsense to me. <clears throat> but anyway, Delmonico's had about everything. And, and the influence in this country was, was certainly English, Northern European, German, uh, later Italian, um, but certainly French. And the problem is nobody in America knew anything about how to cook French food. Uh, and so they tarted it up, as the English would say, and we sort of we said a la Francaise or a la Reine, and we just add these little terms, and the food was pretty awful. Uh, in fact, in 1903, Escoffier wrote his famous cookbook where he lightened up French cooking. You know, all those mother sauces and the heavy white sauce, et cetera. Well, he decided that it was time for a little bit of revolution. Well, we didn't get the message. You know, we were still doing the cooking of the 1840s. And so uh, we still had that very heavy uh, idea of French cooking. Um, one of the chefs at, at Delmonico's uh, wrote a book called The Epicurean, which nobody knows about, which I think is the best cookbook ever published in America. It's about this thick. I have a copy of it. Uh, and it's amazing. Uh, it's the most, it, it, it look, Fanny Farmer looks like a piker compared to this guy. It was incredibly complicated cooking, really interesting, fabulous book. So if you ever, I, I don't know, I assume they make, make uh, modern versions of it, but it's a really interesting book. came out in the 1890s, I think 1892. So there was a lot of good cooking going on, most of it in, in high-end restaurants. Even Boston had some French restaurants. Um, on the other end, of course, there was the diner. And that got started in the 1880s in Providence, Rhode Island. A guy decided to take an old horse cart. Because over time, what was happening is they were being converted to electric trams. And so horse carts were available. He got a horse cart. And the Providence Journal newspaper People you know, were working at night to put out the newspaper. They needed a place to eat. He parked it outside of the newspaper office, and he served for 5 cents a plate or 15 cents a plate. You could get food. Uh, the rich could get the, you know, could get the food with chicken. You know, The poor wouldn't get the chicken. Uh, you could get slices of pie for 5 cents. And that was the beginning of the diner. Eventually, railroad cars were used as diners. That's how the current uh, design came from. They just used either. Uh, tram cars in cities or railroad cars, and that was the beginning of the diner. 
The automat came out of Germany, <coughs> I think it was in the 1880s or 90s. <coughs> Two guys invented the concept. It was uh, <coughs> immediately stolen as an idea and brought to this country. I think Philadelphia was the first one. The thing that's interesting about this is that um, you know, women did not go out to eat very much, especially on their own. And so in the early 20th century, factories are opening, women were out in the workplace, they were getting jobs. And, and one reason, by the way, you wanted to work in a factory where you got paid less money than if you worked as a domestic servant. You'd lose money because you had to have a social life. You, get, you, get, you have a life. You, you work fewer hours. You could go meet people. Well, the Horn and Hard Art was a place you could go and single men and women could go out and have lunch during their lunch break. And that was sort of the beginning of a change in our culture, oddly enough, in, this, in a simple automat where people could actually meet other people. It was a way to, to get out of the strictures of the Victorian age. Um, as we mentioned quickly, uh, a few, about three years ago, four years ago, I decided to research Fanny in her book and the time and put together a 12-course meal which would reflect the cooking of the time. Again, among the wealthy, not the average Joe. But she did have a menu, menus in the back of the book for Christmas and Thanksgiving. This is based on a Christmas-style menu. This is not how they ate every day. That's a different issue. Um, in, the, in the day, though, they would have breakfast, um, which would be leftover meats very often. They'd have a big lunch, uh, and which would be probably three courses. And then supper was just leftovers. It was a very small meal. They might just have oatmeal. <clears throat> they might have uh, cold sliced meats, uh, but the big meal was in the middle of the day. So this was the original Boston Cooking School, the, the left building on uh, Tremont Street. Um, Fanny started working there in the 1880s. Uh, Fanny uh, had polio when she was 14. She couldn't go to college as her sisters did. Uh, she became a cook. She worked in other people's households. Uh, and she came in and she took over eventually for Mrs. Lincoln in the late 1880s as being head of the school. She was a terrific teacher, very forceful personality. Um, and this is a photograph of a private class. That's Fanny sitting down. She, she had a lot of problems with her legs still, and so she often sat, um, sat when she gave courses. Um, in fact, um, a, I think a grandmother of someone I know in Boston actually attended Fanny's, one of her last classes. She died in 1913. And the only thing she wrote in her diary was she was very disappointed that she couldn't finish the candy making class because Fanny died. She was very angry about that. So anyway, um, that's probably the most famous picture of Fanny Farmer with a young student. Um, these were the course notes from that person's grandmother. She actually, the, the family saved them. This is what they handed out in class. And those are the notes in the column that our, his grandmother uh, took while she was taking the course. It was odd. I actually looked at the notes, <clears throat> and a lot of the, it was sort of like Harry Potter. Remember the scene where he's trying to figure out the, the potions, and he gets the book? You know, the same thing. Well, actually, the, the notes ch completely changed the recipes that were written on the piece of paper. So I, I don't know what was going on. Um, this is the stove that I had put in my house in Boston a few years ago. It was from the St. Patolf Club on Commonwealth. It's a, it's a six foot wide, uh, large cast iron stove. The stove, is actually built out of bricks. And then the front's all cast iron with some inserts. But it's built of brick and cast iron. And you can see that they're burners, which are some cast iron uh, circles that lift up. Uh, the two in the middle give you access to the wood, which you'll see here. Um, so the center of the stove opens up. That's where the, you have coal or wood. I converted this to wood. <clears throat> and those are the hottest. The ones on the left and right were medium. The ones in the back were low heat. It turns out, after using this for about a month, I could get the stove from 300 to 520 minutes because I adjusted the flues, I adjusted the grates, I adjusted the fire. So the notion that these were hard to use isn't really true. They were hot, but you could actually adjust the temperatures. What most people did in the days of coal stoves is they would, during the day, they'd have different things. So very hot fire for breakfast because you were cooking bacon or whatever. During the middle of the day, you'd have 350 to 400 degree oven for doing the baking. So you would change for a period of time the, the temperature of the stove, do all that work, and then go on to the next temperature. So they were very smart about how they organized their time. This made a huge mess, however, if it was coal. So if you were unfortunate enough to be a scullery maid, you have to get up at 5 in the morning. They scrubbed and re-blackened the stove every morning. 
uh, and have to start the fire because by 7, 7.30, you had to have a really hot stove to cook the breakfast. Um, I used a lot of old copper pots as well as an all clad there on the left. Um, but that's how you start the fire um, right there. You just use wooden kindling. Um, coal, it turns out, uh, is actually fairly hard to start. Uh, and you have to keep knocking it to, to get the ashes off. Uh, and so managing a coal fire actually takes a lot of experience. Wood's a lot easier. <coughs> uh, this is my test kitchen director, Erin McMurray. She and I worked on this project for a year and a half. This is in my kitchen in Vermont. And uh, that is a calf's head. Um, and we actually made calf's head, uh, uh, we use calf's head to make mock turtle soup. Somebody a long time ago figured out that the one thing that tastes most like turtle is the head of a calf. I don't know how they figured it out, but, but turtles got very expensive by 1880s, 1890s. They were fished out. So people replaced that with this meat, which actually also makes a great stock. So you make a stock, you add vegetables, and then you use the meat to, um, uh, in, the, in the soup as well. Um, attractive, isn't it? I know. Well, if you ever want to really feel like you cook something, cook, cook mock turtle soup. <clears throat> so the first course, it was 12 courses. The first course, we had punch. A word about punch. Uh, punch was something that was served at British uh, pubs uh, and, and houses here as well. Uh, it had lime juice in it, usually a lot of sugar, uh, a variety of alcohols, rum, etc. And it was said that the longer it sat, the better it was. A friend of mine is a punch expert in Boston. He said two-year-old punch, just let it sit. And he says it was really good. Of course, maybe he drank so much he can't remember. But um, they would have it in large bowls, and it would just sit there for days. And then they would dish it out as people wanted. So it was something that was uh, pretty common. Oysters was always the first course after the punch. Um, I, I don't have a picture of it, the mock turtle soup. And you would actually use, um, you probably don't know this, and neither did I. When you make mock turtle soup, you have to make a uh, little fried, and they're referred to in Fanny Farmer as brain balls. Well, that's what they are. They're the brains of the calf mixed with breadcrumbs, a little egg, and then fried in a skillet. Well, it turns out that you have to be very careful in how you prepare the brains, which I won't go into. But um, they will fall apart on you if you're not careful. So we figured that out. Uh, lot, then you have a seafood course of some kind. This is a recipe from Julia Child. Um, it was, I mean, Julia Child from, uh, actually, we did end up using one of Julia's recipes for this, but I tried Fanny Farmer. All of her sauces were very heavy. A lot of amazing amount of flour in them, really, really unappealing, um, because she was using that old-fashioned 1840 approach to these mother sauces. We, we did a very different version of it, which was much lighter. Um, roast saddle of lamb um, uh, with a, uh, uh, sauce. Then we did a salmon. We actually took, uh, we had built two of the burners in the center. We had taken out and we had a grill uh, made, which sat in there. So we actually grilled on the cast iron stove. We had a thermometer uh, and we had an air conditioner in the kitchen. With the air conditioner, standing by the air conditioner, it was 104. And I think at the stove, it must have been 120 to 130. So we grilled uh, the salmon right on the cast iron stove. Fried baby artichokes, this was a typical thing at the time. Um, uh, Canton sorbet. Canton was the source uh, of ginger. Uh, and they made preserved ginger in these ceramic uh, vases, which were shipped, obviously, to the New World. And so that was a, ginger was a very popular flavoring at the time. It was very exotic. We did a roast goose. Uh, it turns out that we had to. We, we took the breasts off, because the breasts and, and the legs cook very differently. We took the breasts off, cooked them separately, and then took the legs and draped them over the carcass and cooked them for a very long time. So we had two totally different cooking methods to do that, which is, is actually a good technique. We made also applesauce using Fanny Farmer's method, which was actually a very good recipe. Uh, and then the gelatins, which are my favorite part of the dinner. <clears throat> gelatins are one of the things that died within a couple years when Jell-O came out in the 1890s. Uh, gelatins were eventually made with Knox gelatin, and they were enormously elaborate. They had molds, which usually weren't too high, because if you went over six inches, you have to add so much gelatin to keep it firm to unmold it. They would be kind of rubbery. So you want just enough gelatin 
so the, it would hold together, but not too much, it would be tough. And we made all of ours using our own gelatin that we made out of calves' feet. Well, it turns out that the, another unknown fact, the, uh, the power of gelatin depends upon the age of the calves' feet. So if we had to adjust for that. And so this one was with champagne grapes. And there's a technique for you. you you'd add the, the, the jelly. You put it in the refrigerator at an angle, let it s sort of half set, take it out, add a, add a layer of grapes, put it back. So when you constructed these, it was a series of, of adding a layer, letting it set, but not entirely adding another layer. It was very, very time consuming. But that's how you got the spiral pattern. <clears throat> this has a strawberry Bavarian in the center. They have a lot of uh, molds where the center was one thing and the outside was something else. So we had a strawberry Bavarian in the center of this, finished with, a, with a, 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 uh, an orange jelly on the outside. Uh, a lot of the molds um, had a variety of colors. They used natural food coloring at the time. Bugs were used for red food coloring. Um, uh, they still are in some places. And they used different kinds of liqueurs or wines for the flavorings as well. Um, this would be a larger mold. This had seven or eight different layers in it. Again, all different flavors. Uh, and those little dots on top are very hard to do. Um, because we, we got a mold which has the little indents at the bottom, but each one had to be done separately with eyedroppers and set, et cetera. <clears throat> and that's what it would look like plated. You see the strawberry Bavarian in the right center. Um, uh, and, th and those, within a period of a few years, once, once Jell-O came out, that was the end of these, which is really too bad. This cake is a mandarin orange cake from Delmonico's. Uh, there were really very few cakes in America. Cakes didn't really... Until baking powder came along, even, even by 1896 when the Fanny Farmer came out, there were not a lot of cake recipes. They had cookies, brownies, individual cakes. They didn't have big layer cakes. That was really the 20th century. But Delmonico's had this, and it was quite uh, an undertaking. Uh, there's, there's many layers. There's a fondant uh, it stands on. There's a filling inside the top layer. Uh, the mandarin oranges are cut in half, and we put a sor mandarin sorbet in them. Uh, it was pretty elaborate. Um, so now on to the 20th century, and the cookware industry really got started. Uh, the Sunbeam Mixmaster, sort of like the Cuisinart in the 1970s, changed home baking. Uh, this came out in the 1930s. Um, and uh, aluminum foil, uh, you know, pot roast in aluminum foil, a manifold cooking in your car in aluminum foil. Uh, Reynolds Wrap was a, was a big deal, changed home cooking. Uh, vegetable oils, uh, the original oil, Western oil, was I think 1911. Um, and that was a new type of oil. People used butter, obviously, or lard, and now oil was available. In fact, oil was the secret ingredient in the chiffon cake. Uh, this was a recipe developed in Hollywood in the 19, late 1920s by a guy who cooked them for the, the, the commissaries at RKO and the big studios, sold them to people individually. He had an apartment, a two-bedroom apartment. He turned one bedroom into his baking center. He would let nobody in. It was very secretive. He, he was careful not to throw out any of his recipes in the garbage. And uh, chiffon cakes became this huge thing. And he finally sold his recipe, I think, in 1946 to Betty Crocker Company, who immediately went on to create 25 different versions of it and become very successful with them. But the secret was, and still today, if you make chiffon cake, is a half a cup of oil. That's the, that's the unusual thing about the recipe. World War II, although this looks a lot like World War I to me, um, changed everything. Um, yes, there was rationing. Uh, there was emergency cakes. A lot of recipes were designed not to use eggs, for example, in cakes. They, they were hard to get hold of. Um, and then people would buy a cut of meat and learn three different ways, a beef stew, a pot roast, a Swiss steak to cook it. But keep in mind, people still knew how to cook. And if you go back to those early cookbooks, you know, to Fanny Farmer, if, if you did a pie recipe, the first, ingre uh, the first uh, instruction was make a paste, which means make a pie pastry. Well, if you said to anyone today on a cooking show, OK, make a paste, you know, make your pie pastry, nobody's going to know what you're talking about. And they're not going to know how to do it. We do it at Cook's Illustrator on the TV show. We, we go through 250 words of explanation about how to do it. In those days, people just did it. Uh, pies, by the way, were used in the Middle Ages as containers. There was just flour and water, uh, no sugar, uh, no fat, and you didn't actually eat the container. It was just a container. Over time, they added fat, and it became something to eat. 
but these were the days when people actually could buy a cut of meat like this and turn it into three meals. They actually knew how to cook. People, there were still people at home cooking. If you go back to the 1890s and figure out where we were, first of all, 30 to 35% of the household expenses were food. Um, and today it's about 5%, 5 to 10%. <clears throat> the average household, uh, usually the woman in the household, was spending seven hours a day in food preparation, serving, and cleanup. That didn't include the kids. That was just food. So by the 1880s, women were fed up with cooking. So people often ask, why do we fall for all this convenience? Well, I know why. Because who wants to spend seven hours a day doing nothing but cooking and cleaning? Nobody. <clears throat> so, well, maybe a few people. But most people know. So when the American industry came along and said, here's a mixer, here's canned foods, which were developed in the Civil War. Um, here's frozen foods. Clarence Birdseye was a fur trapper and biologist. Uh, spent a lot of time you know, in, in the North. And he invented this way of flash freezing foods. Everybody was thrilled. I've read uh, newspaper accounts in the 1880s and 90s in Boston about canned vegetables and fruits. People saying these are better than the ones from my, my grandfather's garden. They were thrilled for the convenience. So the economy, American industry, was simply responding to what people wanted. They didn't want the drudgery. That's why gas and electric stoves took off eventually, because coal stoves were dirty and hard to use. So every time there was pancake mix was easier than making your own. By the way, about two minutes easier, because you can put those ingredients together very easily. Um, one good example, by the way, of this is when cake mixes first came out, you had to, didn't have to add eggs. You just added milk. And it turns out that in, in the 1930s, I think it was the 30s, women felt bad that they weren't involved as much in the process. They weren't really cooking. So they re-engineered the cake mixes to include eggs. Because now people could feel good that they actually baked the cake themselves. So they felt bad that they weren't doing enough. So sometimes it goes in the opposite way. Um, so after, after the Second World War, you know, the, there are no more rules. Right? Everything changed. Uh, food editors basically prostituted themselves to the food companies, more or less, at these big, these big magazines, women's magazines. They, they took money. They got trips. Uh, they promoted the use of the products. And that's how all the fast foods and the convenience foods got into our culture. In the 1950s and 60s, all the women's magazines promoted their use, and the recipes all used it. They call for specific brand names because they were getting paid off. Jim Beard himself, who actually liked electric stovetops, but he, he was a, uh, a spokesperson for the electric stove industry. Um, so people came back after the war. They were experienced different kinds of cooking. Uh, Trader Vic, this guy Vic, uh, decided that Polynesian food uh, would go over well. Of course, what he served had nothing whatsoever to do with Polynesian food in any way, shape, or form. Uh, they didn't have stupid big drinks with you know, hats in them and other things. But he, he was extremely successful selling this fantasy. Um, you know, spaghetti and meatballs, uh, still today, if you go to Rome, um, I was just there last week, you don't get spaghetti and meatballs. You didn't have a lot of meat. You know, meat was its own course. You'd have a small piece of meat, usually a grilled piece of meat. That was it. When they got to America, Italian food all of a sudden changed. It got changed because meat was cheap. So Sunday gravy, where you have you know, 10 pounds of meat you know, cooking all day in, in a tomato sauce, that was never happened, would never happen in Italy. So a lot of those cuisines came to this country. The ingredients were cheap. There was abundance. People had money. And that's why those cuisines changed. And spaghetti and meatballs is sort of the ultimate example of, of that. Um, there was a chef, Boyardee, by the way. really was. Uh, and, uh, and he started selling this garbage in cans. Uh, Borden's instant omelets. Look, I got to ask, how hard is it? I mean, really. You know, it's like, it's like pancake mix. You know, it's like there's three ingredients. What's the big deal? So I guess uh, you can get an instant omelet. Uh, Coca-Cola was really interesting because they got in on the, on the whole food thing. They decided that if you had a dinner party Saturday night, you should serve Coca-Cola. So they had a lot of ad campaigns over the years for Coca-Cola with people dressed up and they're serving a nice ham and, and you're sitting out the Coca-Cola, you know, not the, not the wine, uh, just the Coca-Cola. I'm sure... I'm sure when people visited from other countries, they were surprised. Um, uh, one of my favorite movies of all time. Uh, pasta Revolution. Uh, you know, back in Fanny's time, all pasta was referred to as macaroni. 
People didn't know about the different shapes. Um, you could get it. By the way, you could get pasta from Italy in the 1880s and 90s, but people didn't know much about it. If you look in Fanny's book, uh, when she cooks macaroni, she cooks it for 20 minutes and boils it in milk. And then she baked it. So uh, one of the things that's interesting is if you go back in all recipes, th there was a, in, in B. Smith's book, uh, Consider the Fork, she talks about a recipe where someone says beating egg whites for three hours. Well, what? I mean, really? Um, so I, I went out. I was so pissed off about this that the B. Smith really believed this. I went out and got some, because he used to use twigs. Uh, that was the egg beater, you know? So I, I got a bunch of twigs from behind my house, and I whipped up egg whites in like four minutes. So I don't, you know, you look at these old cookbooks, and people assume that they're true, you know? I mean, maybe it was a typo. Maybe they meant three minutes, not three hours. I don't know. So you can't, you know, believe everything you read, of course. So pasta came to this country, and, you know, in Rome today, actually, it's interesting, versus 20 years ago, you know, when you had a pasta course, the Prima Piatti, it was a little tiny bit of pasta. There's still restaurants in New York, I've forgotten the name, there's one where his mother comes from Italy and cooks the pasta and then goes home, comes three or four times a year. When she serves gnocchi, for example, you get eight little gnocchi like this, and that's about the right size. When I was in Rome last week uh, with my kids, I went to a restaurant someone recommended, and I swear to God, uh, someone got a plate of pasta like, like Mama Leone size. So even the Italians have gone crazy. I mean, they used to get it, you know, and now you're getting these massive quantities of food, which was the hallmark of American cooking at that time, Louis Armstrong. Uh, you know, pictures of Sophia Loren packing it in. I mean, that's just, can you imagine if you, you know, you were in Rome 30 years ago and you were served a plate like that? It's just unbelievable. Um, Jim Beard, uh, actually, I, I met him in 1979 uh, when I was starting Cooks in 1980. Uh, he was very helpful. Um, he, he was the, an early TV cooking host. Um, and in, in person, he was an enormous, well, he was a big guy, like Julia was big, uh, and, and very smart, extremely well read, and, and really entertaining. But he didn't work on TV. For some reason, it just didn't come through. So his TV show did not last, whereas Julia was an instant hit. Um, but of all the people in the food world in America who actually knew what he was talking about, uh, Jim was an extremely well-read guy. Uh, and his book in 1972, American Cookery, I think is one of the great cookbooks. It's, it's more of a cultural treatise. It sort of explains where everything came from. It's extremely well-written. It's, it's worth looking at. Some of the recipes probably don't, you know, are not what you'd want to cook today, but it's a great historical book. Um, of course, Julia uh, came on the scene in 1961 with Mastering the Art of French Cooking. <clears throat> she, um, she hated it when she was referred to as an entertainer, although she was a hell of an entertainer. Uh, and if you think about her career, she, it was really interesting. She was teaching people to cook sort of classic French cooking at a time when classic French cooking was disappearing. You know, she got it at the very tail end. And there was a wonderful book published a couple years ago, Letters to a Friend of Hers in the United States, where she admits that it was like tilting at windmills, where she knew this was a way of life that was going out of style, but she loved it so much that she wanted to do it. So she reinvigorated something that was really in the last you know, months, days of its life, which was classic French cooking. Um, I was a friend of mine's French. And by the way, a word about the French. If um, in Jacques Pepin's memoirs, he talks about Claudine, his daughter, when she was young, and she'd come home from school and she'd ask her mother, "What's for dinner?" And the answer is so French: food. That's always the answer. And if you and, I, and a French friend of mine lives in Boston, I say, "Well, what kind of wine are you serving?" He said, "Red." You know, th this whole notion of perfection in food and in, in writing about food and thinking about food, you know, most cultures eat food, you know? And so what we've done here in, the, in America is taken that whole notion, w which is good and bad, uh, and turned it into a science and turned it into a study, which is fine. But even today in France, you know, most, most people in France, he, this guy, for example, he buys his wine from the same vineyard his father did and his grandfather did. And it's the same vineyard, and he buys his wine for $6 a bottle. And some years it's good, and some years it's not so good. But that's what he drinks. You know, he, does, he doesn't buy $50 bottles of wine. There's an enjoyment of food that's on a very basic level that isn't intellectual. 
I remember many years ago in the 1880s, uh, 1980s, 1880s. That would be many years ago. Yes, when, when Fanny and I were having dinner, um, <laughs> I was in France, uh, and uh, the um, uh, Bernardin was originally started, the, the famous restaurant in New York, uh, was started uh, by Guy Lecoz and his sister, uh, Maggie, in Paris, and I went to the restaurant. While I was by myself, I was meeting someone the next day. So I, you know, table for one, sort of depressing. And, but I did get to watch other people come in. And the French would come in, and a French woman would walk in and announce herself to the room. You know, I'm here, you know. And, and she'd walk in and talk to, to, to Guy Lacoz and sit down, and the hands were flying, and people were arguing, and bread was everything. And then I'd watch the Americans come in, the couples, and they'd sit down, and they'd have their, you know, hunched over, and they were kind of nervous, and they kind of would barely talk. You know, it's sort of like, this is like the French culture with food and the American culture, which has now changed. That was a long time ago. But it says something about our, our approaches. Uh, today, I just interviewed a guy, a couple guys, who work in the world of supermarkets. <clears throat> today, you know, food became a marketing challenge around 1900. Um, I mentioned briefly Kellogg uh, cereal. Um, they had a sanatorium uh, in Michigan. And... Uh, one of the things they figured out was how to make cornflakes. And it was, a, it was a new process. And it was interesting, because a guy called Post was a patient there. And he heard that there were two brothers, two Kellogg brothers, uh, talking about it. One of them was interested in going into business to sell cereals, because cereals were a healthy, considered to be a healthy diet, considering what people usually ate for breakfast, which was meat. So uh, he stole the technology. And so the CW Post Company, a few years later, started with Post Toasties, I think. Uh, and those are the first two big cereal companies, Kellogg's and then Post, who figured out what they were doing there and took it out and started his own company. But today, I don't know if you know this, but you, you probably do, but you don't know the details. Everything you do in a supermarket has been very carefully researched. You are the ultimate guinea pig. They know exactly how many minutes you're going to spend in the store. They know every minute how much you're going to spend in the store. So if you go into a, a supermarket, you always go into what section? The produce section. Why? It makes you feel good about the store. There are lots of colors. It gets you excited. The, the flooring they use in, the, in this part of the supermarket is different than the flooring on the parts of the floor. The lighting is different. They give you a, an upbeat feeling. It's, you know, welcome to the store. Here's what we have. Then you notice that all of the staples, the toilet paper, the paper towels, the cleaner stuff, are in the middle of the aisles. So guess what? You have to go into the middle of the aisle. So it's like rats in a maze. They're trying to get you to go up and down as many aisles as possible. Uh, because the more aisles you go down, the more stuff you're going to buy you didn't want to buy. And that's how it works. And then finally, you go in, usually on the right side, sometimes left, but you have to go all the way around to the other end of the store to get your dairy. So they know exactly what people buy. They put some of it at one end, some at the other end, and then there's a lot of the staples in the middle of the aisles. And with the end caps and other thing, they're trying to get you in. Of course, you all know that breakfast cereals are at a lower height because kids will pick them up. Um, and they also you know, charge people more for putting their product at eye level, for adult eye level. So the whole thing is very carefully considered. And um, there is nothing left to chance in the modern day supermarket. So. And there's a guinea pig right there. So um, questions? I think I did actually the history of food in one hour. So I left a few things out. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much for speaking to us, and thank you for doing this amazing um, test of the Victorian meal. Um, do you think that there are any lessons up to the modern day middle class person um, that can apply from that era, or do you feel it's a very antiquated system? No, I think there's a, the question is, what is there to learn from the Victorian era for today's families? Sure. I mean, food was so expensive at that time. It was one third of all the money you spent in a household. They didn't throw away anything. So when they boiled vegetables, they used that water um, as making a stock. And that's why stock making, by the way, you can make a great stock in a pressure cooker in like 40 minutes, or you can do it on top of the stove in 40 minutes if you want. You don't need hours. The reason you make stock that way is you'd have it in the slow burner in the back, and you keep throwing stuff into it all day. It was a way of economizing. You could make a stock based on scraps, so nothing was thrown out. You know, I always look at um, 
living in Boston and Vermont, but when I'm in Boston, there's a little convenience store at the edge of the square, and I see the poorest people go in and buy the worst, most expensive food. You know, they buy the, the hostess stuff and the snacks and et cetera. It's the worst stuff and it's the most expensive stuff. So you can, by following some of those basic principles, you can cook on very little money and produce great food. And that's, that's the thing I don't understand because, and that's something we're working on doing right now. If you know a little bit about cooking, you can reduce your food bill substantially and have food that's 20 times better. I mean, some of the best food, I, one of the things I just had in Rome was this little trattoria, uh, no tourists, it was just where people go for, during lunch. And they served little, tiny, because meatballs tend to be small. Um, I think they were veal. And just four or five little, tiny meatballs in a sauce with beans, cooked cannellini beans. Well, it cost pennies to make that, and it was delicious. Uh, the other thing, I think, is that the ratio of meat to other ingredients, we have it all backwards in this country. Most of the world has the 80-20 rule. We have the 20-80 rule. Um, you know, meat in most parts of the world is a flavoring. It's like a spice. Uh, and, and so you add that to sort of flavor your couscous or flavor your cassava root or flavor whatever it is. So a little bit of protein, which is the expensive part of the diet, uh, knowing how to cook, um, you know, Jacques Pepin, for example, or Julie or anybody else, can for very little money make a great meal. And so knowing how to cook, you don't have to be a, a chef, but knowing how to cook, you have great food and it doesn't really cost you very much money. I think that's the takeaway. Yeah. What would you say are like the five or ten most essential skills a cook needs to be able to do to perform and make good food? Uh, what are the five or ten essential skills you need? Um, uh, well, let's see. The first is knowing when a pan is hot. Um, and the way to do that is to put a, about a teaspoon or two of oil, vegetable oil, in the pan, heat it up. When it just starts to smoke, it's 450, and that's the temperature you want to saute. That's the first thing. Two, you need a sharp knife. Nobody has a sharp knife. Um, in the days when people used to invite me over for dinner a long time ago, um, I, I, and this is probably why I don't get invited, I used to go to the kitchen and like sneak into the, look at the drawers, you know? And, and, and all the knives were like dull, you know? And nobody had a knife sharpener. They had, they had a sharpening steel, but that doesn't sharpen knives. That tunes up a knife, doesn't sharpen. So buy a chef's choice knife sharpener, cost $130. It's model 130, which I guess is why it's $130. Um, that works great. You can use a sharpening stone, but you actually need to be experienced to do that. So just buy an electric one, the chef's choice. Three, buy an instant read thermometer that really works. A thermopen makes a very expensive one at 95 hours. It's what we use in the kitchen. You can tell when bread is done, custard is done, pastry cream is done, meat is done, fish is done, everything. It takes the guesswork out of, and, and the, the question people always ask, when is it done? You know, my 23-year-old's my a great baker. But the one question she always has for me is, when is it done? Well, if you get an Easter egg thermometer, I'll tell you. Uh, so that's really helpful. Um, I, think the, I think another thing is taste the food before you serve it, especially, obviously, if it's a cake, you can't do it, but a stew, braise, tagine, whatever, um, soup. You know, so many people, I see it all the time, and I used to do it, they'll follow the recipe, make it, and serve it, and they haven't tasted it, or they haven't tasted it near the end. Well, it turns out that at the very end, a little salt, a little vinegar, you know, I have some sort of secret ingredients you can add at the end. The things you can add at the end of cooking are a little um, minced garlic or pressed garlic, ginger, fresh herbs usually should be added towards the end, vinegar. Um, this is an ingredient I made fun of for 20 years and now I use pomegranate molasses, which actually is a great secret ingredient you can add to a stew, just like a few teaspoons. Um, so taste the food before you serve it. Uh, and the last most important thing is, every time I've been lucky enough to cook with someone who's cooked all their life, it's always really simple. You know, years ago, I was invited back in the 80s uh, to a brunch. I hate brunch, but I was invited to brunch. I don't get brunch. It's like, I'm up at 6.30 in the morning on Sunday, I'm sorry. I'm like, brunch is like, forget it. So they were English, and they, were, they really wanted to impress us with brunch. They had 20 dish, literally 20 dishes on the table. Smoked salmon, you know, the, bag the bagels, nah, 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 the eggs. Nah. So like muffins, you know, breads, pumpkin bread. And, and you just go, oh my God, you know, they must have taken three days to cook the food. If they had prepared one thing well, it would have been so much better. <laughs> really, I mean, just make one thing, you know. Don't, and I, I used to do this all the time. I used to like create all these things. Just make a soup, you know. Buy a baguette, 
Heat it up in the oven, 375 for seven minutes. Crisp it up. Um, have some fruit, you know, whatever. You, you don't need a lot of stuff. If you went over to Julia Childs in Cambridge, she might make an oyster stew and buy some bread. Done. And copious amounts of wine and a cocktail before you started. Uh, but, you know, that works too. But that's the secret is keep it really simple. People don't want eight things or ten things. One really good thing is always better. And the last piece of advice is if you're cooking with a significant other, you should make dessert. The last thing people eat is the thing they remember. So never get stuck with the first course because they always forget the first course. Make dessert because that's what they'll remember last. So just keep it really simple. So those are my few words of wisdom. Yeah. Why do you think it is that we have to ask that type of question or what are our essential skills? What happened to everyone just learning those essential skills as, as families taught their kids to cook and whatnot? Well, that's a good question about why we lost the skills. I think the answer is there was at least one generation where people didn't know how to cook. I mean, look, the reason make a paste worked is everybody cooked and there were generations. There was, you know, people had more than one generation under a household, which is now happening again. Um, but so you had someone around, at least one person really knew how to cook, so you get those skills firsthand. That's the best way to learn how to cook. I learned how to cook to bake that way from watching someone. Um, and so there was at least one generation who didn't have that, and so people no longer knew how to cook. And so that's why one reason people watch cooking shows, I guess, is sort of like having someone there. You can sort of you know, absorb that, watch people cook. But if even in our own test kitchen, we have 45 test cooks, we'll have people come in to do bench tests to see if we want to hire them as interns for three months. And I'll see all sorts of, you know, you see some amazing things. We'll have our, our readers come in and make, they all make the same recipe. Every few months we have a bunch of people in. I, there's one recipe for a, a um, chicken cutlet uh, where you take the boneless, skinless chicken breast and you, you, know, you cut it in half and then pound it to a quarter inch thickness. I saw one person holding the chicken breast like this and then sawing down you know, with a knife. I see some of our own test cooks, sometimes with a knife, they hold, it's like a snake. They hold it like this, like sort of at the edge. So people haven't been around that. But for centuries, for millennia, people knew how to cook, and they taught other people how to cook. And now, now that's no longer true. And I think there's one other reason. 50 years ago, people had a very limited recipe repertoire. Um, I have recipe collections from people I grew up with who taught me to cook. They had less than 100 recipe cards, 50 to 75. If you lived in Tuscany, in a part of Tuscany, you didn't make uh, Argentinian food or Thai food or you didn't make Turkish food you know, or English food. You made the food of your 20-mile radius, and you made it over and over again. So I've made baking powder biscuits over 1,000 times. I can do it in my sleep. If you do it enough, then you don't need a recipe, and you, don't, you get it down. And then you know what the dough is supposed to feel like. Is it too wet? Is it too dry, et cetera? If I go to make a recipe I'm not familiar with, I, I, I'm starting at zero like anybody else. I don't know what a particular Thai dish is supposed to be like. So I think the problem is, and, and I suggest people, take 25 recipes that span the range of things you want to cook, a stew, a braise, whatever, uh, a simple bread, uh, like a soda bread, whatever and get really good at those to the point you don't need to look at a recipe. 25 recipes, you know how to cook. You can cook almost anything with 25 basic recipes. So limit your repertoire. You know, if the analogy I always use is music. Um, I, I have a typical guy, I'm a, I'm a deadhead from way back, uh, and so we have a dead cover band. We play it at a pig roast every year. So I, I think having a band playing once a year, there's something wrong with that, but anyway, we play once a year. But you know, the fact of the matter is Jerry Garcia did scales for two hours a day. He didn't just make this shit up. He knew what he was doing. And you cannot sit down at the piano, I'm sorry, and play well unless you understand the theory and understand how things, how chords work and how scales work and you know, what an augmented fifth is. Same thing in cooking. If you have those basic skills, you can be creative. You cannot be creative unless you have the basics down. You cannot pick up a guitar and sound like Jerry Garcia without understanding what he was doing. He understood everything about the guitar. So I would say, if you want to be a great cook or be a creative cook, you do have to get the basics down. And I think with 25 recipes under your belt, you're probably halfway there. So, yeah. Uh, I think it's interesting because I feel like we're having this resurgence of this health food craze right now. Uh, what did he say about health food, and what do you think he would think of what we view as healthy food today? Uh, well, he was. It's a, it's an interesting question. You know, Sylvester Graham believed in whole foods. No, he didn't. You you eat raw food. He was a raw food guy. 
Uh, Adam Gopnik uh, wrote a great book about food, and he talks about the French Revolution and, and French restaurants. Everyone thinks it was all these chefs, you know, at, at uh, the big houses in France. Of course, when they had their heads cut off, they had nothing to do, so they started restaurants. That's actually not true. What, what happened was there, there was a cuisine bourgeoise, which was very simple food. It was simple local fruits and vegetables, a lot of raw food. It was very simple. It was very healthy. So actually, health food goes way back in time. But his notion was as raw as possible. Don't cook it. The more you cook it, the worse it is. So he was into that kind of food, which is very popular today. So about every 100 years, this comes around, goes around, and uh, it'll, it'll happen again. It's like when someone, uh, you know, over the years, I've been interviewed a few times, and <laughs> the worst question, I and mean, I get this all the time, is, you know, comfort foods are back. You know, and I say, well, name a food that's not a comfort food. I mean, what food isn't comforting? It's sort of like this, this thing is, you know, meatloaf is back. Well, where did it go? It didn't go anywhere. It's like we've been eating meatloaf all this time, you know. Mashed potatoes have never been out of style. So it, I think food writers like to think there's something new. Well, there are some things they knew, but the fact of the matter is food, home cooking changes very slowly. Restaurant cooking has changed, you know, as, uh, as uh, our, our leader, Glorious Jose, would say. You know, what he does is really cutting edge. But most people at home, it's a much slower change. It's about to change more. But in the last 30 years, it's really changed very slowly. There were some people over here somewhere? No, there weren't. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> what is your favorite part of working with Cook Illustrated and why? Uh, my favorite part of working for Cook Illustrated and why? Well, uh, I'm the boss, so <laughs> that's really my favorite part. Uh, although I only get one vote. Uh, I don't know if you know how it works, but we, when we put stories in the magazine, there's a great story uh, back in the eight, 1980s. <laughs> if I start saying 1780s, you know. Um, I was owned in part by the New Yorker magazine for a few years before it was sold to Cy Newhouse. When Cy Newhouse bought it, uh, Steve Floria was the publisher. And he, he came from GQ, and he had lunch with uh, the editor, and uh, Mr. Sean. And he asked Bill Sean how he decided what his readers wanted to read. And Bill Sean said, well, actually, I don't ever think about that. And he said, could you please explain? He said, well, I, I just put things in the magazine I'm interested in, and I'm, I'm standing up for my, the interests of my readers. I assume they have my interests. Six months later, he was fired, and, um, and, and they went through a different system. I, I use the opposite system, which is I ask all of you. Uh, we've reviewed 7,000 recipes. We send out surveys through SurveyMonkey every two days. We know exactly what you want to cook. And so my opinion about what goes in the magazine is pretty worthless because we just put in what everybody else uh, wants. But I can tell you something about yourselves. You are, are desperate liars, all of you. <laughs> you tell me, you always say, I want healthier recipes. I want more vegetables. And that actually is starting to become more true than it was. But anything with chocolate, pork, or potatoes in it always gets the best rating. So <laughs> you know, it's like Jekyll and Hyde. Is the two, thing, two things going on here. I, I think, to be serious for a second, um, w um, I went to a boarding school where we had these long wooden tables. And we sat around and argued. And we have those exact tables in the office. So we sit around having meetings, arguing with each other about stuff. And I. I, you know, if there's a problem with a recipe, the person talks about it, and we say, do this or do that, or don't do this or don't do that. We have a lot of, you know, smart people, and we argue all day, which is my favorite thing to do other than cook. So I love to do that. Anything else? Anybody else? Great. Thanks so much for coming. Thanks.